lived in Germany, in the UK, in Dubai, now in New York. I'm married to Lebanese. I've got staff in Ivory Coast, in Kampala, and in South Africa. Remittances is my entire life. It's ridiculous. Um, and I think, you know, we come a long way. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad used to send a check via DHL to my mom. So there are, progress has been made, but I think we need more. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a real challenge there and, and, and FinTech can probably solve a lot of these problems. So inviting to the stage um, to facilitate this conversation on diaspora banking and remittances, I'm happy to invite Thomas Debas, who's Chief Partnership, Partnerships Officer and Managing Director at the Office of Global Partnership at the Department of State. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. And our other speakers are getting mic'd up. Are you comfortable there? I'm very good. Yes. Kids, can we hear you? Huh? Can we hear you? Okay, great. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. One last speaker, and after this, we'll have lunch. It's <laughs> a lot of pressure. You're put, you're I know, before lunch, that's not right. <laughs> we have, we a, lot have a lot of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> wrap it up, wrap it up, man. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, and uh, we were just joking, it's, it's hard to be the, the, the panel before, before yeah. lunch. And the last thing you want to do is be in front of people's yeah. times to eat. So we try to be as, uh, as fun as possible to at least give you entertaining in that side. So uh, my name is Tomas Tebas. Uh, um, I am uh, a managing director at the US Department of State, uh, managing the Office of Global Partnerships. Uh, you might be asking, why is this dude moderating uh, a conversation around remittances and diaspora? Uh, the obvious thing might be this, this dude looked like an African, which guilty of. Um, but most importantly, I had the pleasure of almost in this building, and I'm seeing Jim Thompson, my colleague. I'm aging us, but uh, about almost 14, 15 years ago, I had the pleasure of managing USAID's diaspora and remittances agenda. And for, for two years, Jim and I had a lot of fun doing a lot of things that the USAID did not even understand what it was. And uh, so in that work, we did um, uh, remittance-backed uh, mortgages in El Salvador. Uh, we looked at housing insurance schemes through remittances. We did a lot of, we tried to, we attempted to do diaspora bonds with Deutsche Bank. Uh, we attempted to do securitization of future flows of remittances with Echo Bank. Uh, but in short, what I'm trying to tell you is um, we have a lot of experience and, and insights in terms of how diasporas are engaged and most importantly, how remittances are facilitated. Uh, but to this date, I'll be honest with you, the most elusive thing for me to fully understand and trying to uh, support from a remittances security, I mean, remittances perspective has been this sole militant focus on reducing cost of remittances, right? Because there are folks talk about it's too high and all that, but there isn't a lot of conversation about not just the velocity of money, but the depth of money. What do you do with that money once it lands on? Um, so I, I give you that context to, to start the conversation. I have the pleasure of moderating this impressive list of uh, uh, organizations, uh, some whose their entire DNA is remittances, like MoneyGram, and there are some FinTech companies uh, 
up-and-coming ones and, and some uh, um, uh, veteran ones who are all looking at how remittances could be impacted by blockchain or by uh, uh, financial technologies and what have you. And so what I will do is uh, you have the, because uh, we are, time is kind of constrained, I'm not gonna go through their, their entire bio, you can find that on the program. So I'm gonna let each of them introduce themselves and most importantly, what is their play in this diaspora banking and remittances space? Mm -hmm. And then we can kind of expand from that. So I'm gonna start with Gabrielle all the way on the other side, Gabrielle Patrick, who's the CEO and General Counsel of uh, NABU, please. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Gabrielle Patrick. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called NABU. It stands for Ubank spelled backwards. We are a FinTech that uh, secures transactions today. We have a cybersecurity platform and we're in the process of being a UK sponsored bank so that we could provide correspondent banking services to African FIs. Awesome, great. Can you, could you tell us a little bit about what, what the play for you is on the remittances side? I know you described what you're trying to attempt, but why is that attractive to you on remittances and diaspora banks? So part of what is not discussed is that the, the cost of remittances and a big contributor is that all remittance companies require banking. They, they specifically require sponsor banking. And in the UK, there's been a monopoly on that um, sponsor banking provision for 250 years. So now with the availability of technology, there can be new entrants like myself, which could provide that access very reliably without um, Af African FIs being at the risk of being onboarded at short, short notice because of an overestimation of African risk. Okay. And so that would mean that with another provider, there's more competition, which means that the cost of their infrastructure is cheaper, which has a knock-on effect to the retail um, um, consumer. Phenomenal, great. Next is Femi, Femi Olagon, please. Uh, he's a senior growth manager at Leatherback. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, the name is um, Olu Femi, or Femi for short. Um, I currently work with um, Leatherback as the senior, as the senior growth manager. Uh, Leatherback is a multi-currency um, um, solution provider, whereby we're able to provide um, bank accounts in the local, co in the local countries for our customers clients or businesses across multiple uh, countries. Currently in our portfolio, we have uh, 13 currencies whereby we're able to provide bank accounts for our clients. And um, that makes it more seamlessly for them to move funds across their own bank accounts because these accounts are held locally in those um, countries. As an example, um, we can issue bank accounts in GBP, um, in, in USD, um, in the, for, the, for the CFA zone, um, also for ZA, for NGN. Um, so again, in, in that aspect, that makes it quite easy for as a customer or as a business, um, if you think of starting up, for example, if you're in Ghana and you're looking to go into the UK, you don't have to have a business in the UK. We can offer you a banking solution whereby you can receive funds in the UK and you can have that sent about to Ghana. And the other product which we have again is the sender, which is a remittance part of it, whereby aside not being able to provide bank accounts to some key countries, you can actually make payments. Um, directly to those countries, like to China, um, India, and other sort of countries. So, in terms of um, the remittance space and banking solutions, we know um, the product which we are bringing would help um, drive down the costs and also would help improve the experience that customers have in moving funds around globally. Awesome. Next is uh, Hugh Sifole. Uh, he's the head of strategic partnerships and corridor development at the MoneyGram. Thank you. Thank you for having. Thank you for having me. Good. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone and audience watching us online. I hope you're doing well. Uh, my name is Uge Foley, originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I am the head of key partnerships and strategic development for MoneyGram. I also have the pleasure of managing corridor developments for MoneyGram, which means not just Africa, but all the corridors outbound of North America. So, um, and I'm here today extremely proud uh, to represent a company that's um, deemed as one of the leaders in terms of global remittance. So you cannot speak about global remittance without mentioning my employer, MoneyGram International. Um, what we, we were joking kind of yesterday with somebody who said, well, you guys are kind of a legacy company and, 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 and I'm eager to talk about changing this conception of legacy, we embrace it, but I think we are also tested and proven, but we are also very much a FinTech company now as we're looking at creating solutions for today's environment in terms of financial inclusion globally. So looking forward to the discussions. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, next is Omo Salewa. Oh, as I love the O part. Uh, Adeyemi, who's the global head of partnerships and expansion of Flutterwave. 
Yes, uh, Oma Shalewa, I go by O. I oversee global partnerships, expansion, and market penetration at Flutterwave. Um, we are the back end of um, many of the new age digital remittance companies. And towards the end of last year, we also launched our remittance products, which um, is leveraging on the connections that we've built for remittance delivery in Africa, whether it's into bank accounts, into mobile wallets, or even um, cash pickup locations. Awesome. Great. So um, let's start with data. I mean, uh, there is uh, the, um, the University of IUPUI, which is the Indiana University. I'm going to mess up the acronym, but my friend. <laughs> Purdue University, I'm sorry, yes, Ooh. And Purdue. Uh, they uh, track, we, we use their data set to talk about why, <clears throat> at least for us, why global partnerships are important. Yeah. Because if you think of financial flows, I think they've tracked about 46 countries. There are about 80, $834 billion outflows, cross-border flows that happens around the world. Uh, the number one flow, as you could guess, mm -hmm. is remittances. Absolutely. It's about $481 billion. Mm -hmm. So the reason remittances are important is not because we're being inclusive and, and all that other jazz that come with that. It's because the data shows that there are a significant amount of resources that are flowing around the world. And if you just focus on Africa, the, the, I think the 2019 data is about uh, $49 billion. So uh, we, we don't suffer from poverty of imagination why you all are interested in the subject matter, right? Uh, but what I'm interested to learn first from Hughes maybe is because I told you yesterday you were the biggest elephant in the room, yeah. uh, is that how you, uh, like, the, I mean, remittances have been around since biblical days. It's not right. new, obviously, right. they'll continue to happen. But in this new era of how technology is transforming a lot of things, how velocity of resources happening, borders are kind of thinning, all those things, uh, and decentralization movements are happening both on policy and, 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 and resources. So I'd love to hear your perspective, and, and I'm going to get to each of you, from your institutional perspective, how these things are evolving. So first of all, I think um, we, we take remittance very, very seriously because it impacts a lot of families globally, right? Um, being an immigrant, I fully understand uh, how important it is. Uh, it's not just a notion of sending money. I'm sharing a message. It's a means of communication and a means of, of exchange with my family, my loved one, people who sacrifice for some of us to be where we are. Whether there is COVID, no COVID, I'm sending money. Um, the LA Times reached out to MoneyGram, reached out to us during COVID, and especially to me. And um, the question was asked whether, and this was in March, and I won't take too long, March uh, when COVID, April when COVID hit. And the World Bank was predicting a 20% decrease, if you all you might, might, might remember. And I was unapologetic, and I said, it's not going to be that stiff of a decline. Because you see, as an immigrant, I understand whether there's COVID, in fact, when there's COVID here, my family is still expecting me to send money. So you might see a decline in the face amount, but you're not gonna see a decline in the frequency. Because you see, during COVID, most of the folks who were still in the front line were immigrants, All right? So at the end of the year, we were proven to be right. The decline was about 7%, okay? So what does, where does MoneyGram stand with regards to the responsibility of, 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 of remittance? We are at the forefront. We take chances. We are embracing technology. We are embracing collaboration with different companies in the fintech world because we realize it's going to take a village to really fulfill the gaps or close those gaps that we have. Uh, today, we are traditionally P2P, cross-border payment, but we are also looking at avenues in P2B, B2P, so on and so forth. Because at the end of the day, it's about financial inclusion, closing the gap. So MoneyGram has taken the leap of, of now creating partnerships between the crypto world and you know so you have fiat currency and crypto we're also taking the leap into creating that avenue uh, we we signed some agreement with stellar foundation for example recently where we want to be the company that known not just a legacy but a company that's adapting faster than perhaps a competition we're taking those chances because we realize 
the market is big for everybody and we want to play a major role into that. Okay, so on that, let me go to you, oh, uh, you've recently deployed a send uh, money assignments as a uh, component to it. Uh, why, how does, I mean, you guys are well-known unicorn uh, in, in Africa in terms of the fintech space. So this is a new era for, I assume, a new space that you're getting into. Could you kind of walk us through why you're getting into it and how your thinking is going to... Yeah, um, it's actually not a new space for us. We've been operating in the remittance space, I want to say, for about three, four years okay. now. We just... Um, have not had a direct-to-consumer play. So we've been at the back end of consumer platforms that need to send into Africa. Mm -hmm. And really the reason, or one of the reasons why we decided to become a more consumer-facing product is part of our overall strategy to create um, more areas of focus for the business. Historically, we've been B2B, um, servicing business that need to accept payments or businesses that need to send payments across Africa. And now we understand that if we're really going to impact the digital payments ecosystem, remittances and other areas, we need to build solutions that address all the parties in the equation. Businesses are one part of that. But a very big part of that are also consumers who have challenges sending money home, who have challenges transacting with businesses. And so it's part of our overall strategy to, to build solutions that address a different population, but of the same ecosystem. Love it. Okay. So now for Femi and Gabrielle, both of you are in, you have a license, a banking license, yeah. and you're in temp. So I'm going to ask you kind of a diaspora banking question. I assume yeah. that's the, so what is the, there are a lot of local banks yeah. in Africa who are attempting or doing diaspora banking by allowing uh, diasporas to bank in their, which is a huge resource of hard currency for them, right? Yeah. We all know how, um, how, um, what type of lacking there is on for foreign exchanges in these, in these markets. Do you see yourself that you are eating their lunch, so to speak, in a sense of the banks in, uh, in, in, uh, in Africa versus what you're, you, is your offering similar to the local banks on the ground? Okay. Uh, oh, I, start I, with I Gabriel. Go. Um, ours is very dissimilar, so they would be our customers. The, the, the issue is that um, most uh, banks that want to flow funds internationally require a sponsor, um, especially if they want um, euros, uh, pounds, or, or dollars. Yeah. Some of those U.S. sponsors tend to be banks like Citibank and J.P. Morgan. His, historically, there's been an issue where African risk has been overestimated, and so that's created a scenario where uh, those banks are um, at the bottom of the totem pole, to be very frank, and these sponsors kind of pick and choose who they want to let into the club. So the short answer is that our proposition would not be a competitive, it would be complementary where we'd be looking to enter the market and provide those reliable reels at, a, at an affordable price. There's no reason why uh, an African FI or FinTech or an African PSP, for example, like Flutterway, which is a unicorn, mm -hmm. has to overprove its, um, its uh, controls or resilience, um, which is disproportionate to any other uh, FinTech of the same level of development in a different jurisdiction. And that's the specific problem that we're looking to solve. Okay. okay, I'll probably say uh, we're, we're kind of offering the best of both worlds in the sense that we're able to um, provide banking solutions and also um, on, on the remittance side. So um, it's a big market that um, everyone can, can take advantage of. And for us, in terms of being able to drive down the cost, which is key, and making it quite easy for funds to be moved across borders. So for us, we don't see it in terms of... Um, it's, um, it's going to be a challenge. We see it more of as an opportunity and trying to make things a bit more agile and a bit, a things a bit more better for, at the end of the day, the customer that the key things which we're looking after to ensure they have a good experience. Okay. Um, Hughes, could, have you thought about, I mean, you guys have been traditionally and exclusively about putting money from A to B. Sure. Uh, have you thought about the banking element of it? There's a lot of flows on digital banks and things like that. Do you have any play on actually banking these uh, your clients versus just uh, providing transfer service? No, I think I think what we perhaps what I should have done also is uh, in, insist on the fact that we touch about two billion banks uh, through our rails yep. so we provide the opportunity for customers today 
to move money digitally, however you want. You can pick up in cash, you can pick up directly, funds can be deposited into your bank account mm -hmm. or to a mobile wallet. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily need to jump into becoming a bank or whatnot because we collaborate with banks. We leverage banks so, um, and we see them as partners into this ecosystem. Um, and so for us, it's more customers today can go into our app, MoneyGram app, uh, you download and you can you have options. You can you can send money through somebody to pick up in cash, you can send money somebody to pick up in a bank account or a mobile wallet and even in certain countries, home delivery options. Yeah. So we find ourselves in a position where we understand we are in we have over five hundred thousand uh, uh, locations, partners globally. And in Africa alone we have over seventy two markets where we are digitized. So meaning we have we have different ways of touching customers and we continue to grow. Okay, so I, I see that, but let me, this is for everybody. One of the, the frustrations that we had from a policy perspective is that at least the literature shows that remittances are mostly used for consumption. Correct. Um, so how do you turn these flows to a productive assets? That's my question to you in a sense is, have you ever been able to create financial instruments or financial products that are still backed by these flows? that they would be able, you know, then they could buy homes, they could do things. And I'm broadly, this is not just for you, but every one of you who touches these resources, are at least the start of the new ones, are you thinking through those things, or are you just on the velocity of money? I can grab that, but I don't want yeah. to hold it. You want to, you want to start <laughs> that, and then I'll finish? Um, for me, this is complex because, you know, you know, speaking from my point of view, maybe for others, you know, we can't be all things for all people. Yes. And the proposition that I am uh, leaning at this time, it, it is nuanced. And so I would love to be able to diversify and, and do these things today. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think we all have investors and bottom lines and, and as much as we have families down home, you, you do need to be focused in terms of what your, your proposition and the product suite is. So I think that's my uh, input on that. For, for us, um, it's more <coughs> a combination of both customers and businesses. So we're not necessarily focusing only on the Remington side. Mm -hmm. um, it's a key thing whereby the multiple bank accounts which, which we're offering, it gives a seamless way of moving money across. So it's not necessarily in terms of just the customer. But again, we're thinking in line and to make things a bit more easier because we're looking at the aspect whereby customers are able to make payments via the card because we're going to start issuing um, cards to, to those accounts. And with those cards, they're linked to the multi currencies whereby whenever they go to, they can select whatever currencies they want to pay, make payments with. So we're looking ahead of just the remittance side of it, but actually seeing how we can help businesses grow and globally and make things a bit more seamlessly for them. I know. From, for, for us, it's about. So I wanted to answer this. I was tempted to answer it as, as an employee of MoneyGram, but more so as an African. So if you allow me, I'll do both. Right? As as a consumer, I'll start as a consumer. Your question is very poignant because at the end of the day, it's about data. Right? The data is there. Why can't that information? You've been sending money for quite some time. Why can't that information be? converted through AI to convert it into an element that banks can use to perhaps qualify for a loan. It creates tremendous amount of opportunity. So this is in my head as, as an immigrant because I see the tremendous value that, the, that, that we could bring into the market. Now, I'll, I'll come back to my employer. Is this, to your point, is this part of our core business for the time being? Probably not. But I'll put an asterisk. You never know. Because as long as I'm there, as an African, as an immigrant, I'm not shy about throwing ideas into what we can do, what the potential is. I think I echo a lot of the same sentiment, right? It's very important that you focus. Um, and a part of being focused is starting to show the areas or the gaps that you have in being able to build a better product for the market that you're serving. And the ultimate goal is even if Flutterwave can't enter this space in the immediate term, if we can create enough value and enough business and enough transactions, somebody will start something to cater to that gap. Okay. So. Makes sense. Gabriel, I'm going to go back to you. You've mentioned it very briefly in your response about 
the whole EKYC situation, you're a lawyer, and, yeah. and the, you are absolutely right. There is a perception when it comes to KYC and how Africans are treated yeah. in, in the regulatory side. Could you elaborate a little bit about how you're obviously, your product is trying to address some of that, but broadly speaking from an industry perspective, how that is impacting the African community? Um, the short answer is that there is an overestimation of African risk B because a company is geographically located in an African country does not mean that they're high, that it's high risk. That's just an affront to common sense. And so you do have a dynamic where there are large um, African banks with a significantly stellar track record who are still like crabs in a barrel trying to get sponsored for um, various cons uh, currencies that I mentioned, like dollars and, and, and pounds and sterling. So what we have discussed with the regulators and how we are structuring our uh, correspondent banking services is to simply have proportionate risk. It, it's as simple as that. If, if you are a legitimate company that has a, a track record or are early stage fintech um, and your uh, ultimate beneficiaries are above board, you could demonstrate controls. Um, if you have a track record, even better. Um, it, it's all about just having a proportionate risk appetite where companies are not excuse me, uh, penalized because of their ge geographical uh, 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 disposition. The, the other thing I wanted to add is, I do think it's quite significant that we're all here on this panel. But for me, this would not have been possible five years ago. And it, it's tied to the risk management and the, and the risk assessment. We know our culture better than anyone else. And so that is really the core answer to your question as to why there has been this disproportionality where our community has been punished because th there's a, a lack of understanding or a lack of interest in understanding our culture. And I think this is a time where we could really take control of that. Mm -hmm. And that, to Hugh's point, it does take a village. I don't think we all have to solve all of the problems out, um, uh, uh, in, uh, individually, but collectively we could solve those problems. Yeah. I love it. Great. Anybody else on that regular thing? Yeah, I think there's always, with anything in life, there's a certain level of comfort with something that you're familiar with, mm -hmm. right? And the reality is, outside of Africa, not very many people are familiar with Africa. Um, I have stories for days in the course of trying to expand outside of Africa. Um, on how complex it can be. Uh, whereas someone can walk into a meeting and say, this is my product, this is what I'm trying to do, whether it's funding you're looking for or whether it's a partnership that you're looking for, it's not usually the story with me um, and with Flutterwave, really, to be honest. There, there's usually that groundwork that needs to be done to even explain the continent. Mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's just a hurdle that, unfortunately, uh, as African businesses, we're going to have to cross. The other thing that's really important is that we, we build some of these things ourselves, right? Which is why um, what Patricia is doing is, is, is very interesting and <laughs> it's really needed, right? If I'm an African business and I'm trying to convince a UK bank or an European bank to work with me, I have to first tell that story of this is Africa. This is how you can quantify risk. The fact that somebody has received money three times this week does not necessarily have to be a huge cause of concern. It could be the most simple explanation of they have a family member who is in another country hustling and can only send specific amounts <laughs> on any given day, right? It, it doesn't have to be a huge flag. And she will understand that better than someone who has no expand, uh, exposure to Africa. I see. It's not just an AI, but African intelligence. And, it's and it's the human beings. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and, you know, not to sound evangelical, sorry, Hughes, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I just feel that historically, for different reasons that we're all sensitive for, we've had to ask permission. We, we don't have to ask permission anymore. We have the technology, we have the resources, and we have the community to just take control of our own destiny and own our own money supply. And for me, the conversation we're really having here about the diaspora banking remittances is really a conversation about owning our own money supply. Yeah, and I think maybe to close out on, on, on this very, very important point is um, there's an old say in Africa, again, when you point your finger, at one person, the other four are pointing at you. Mm -hmm. So self-reflection is important. Yeah. How do we, African, change the narrative? We understand, we depend on it, right? 
it's a big portion of our GDP in many cases. Why is it that financial literacy is not a critical element into our education system? Because reality is, look, let's face it, MoneyGram, our competitors, and most of us here, we're in the business, we see a need, we're trying to close that gap, right? So nobody's here to screen out, to, to, to hurt our own business. We want those money to be flowing, but there's also a shared set of responsibility for us African to understand what is it that a vehicle is needed. So maybe I'm confusing the system. You know, I am a pastor, yeah. but I told, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a pastor, I'm giving you an example. Mm. You are a pastor, you are based in the UK, but you are from Ghana, mm. right? But you have members of your so-called church all over the world. Hughes is in the US, is sending you money, $100 for the prayer that you gave. Now, you are also sending him $100. And three. So while it's a legitimate, okay transaction, but it falls outside of the norm of the algorithm that I've put in the system. So how do we, African, tell our own story so that the culture can be embedded into the algorithm to actually make the, the, the transaction flawless? Mm. So to me, I'll push it back to us as African. Now I'm not the MoneyGram guy, I'm speaking as an African that Maybe there's an opportunity out there for some media outlet, some companies to create an avenue where you can A, educate people on financial literacy, what it means, and what the responsibilities are, and then also how do we tell our stories to the world. Very powerful narrative. I mean, actually Africa is having a moment when it comes to narrative, right? Yeah. Look at Afrobeats. Yeah. Yeah. Three, four years ago, you would not listen to a single radio and a song in Africa. Now it's all that. Yeah. So there is a moment of awakening about what the African narrative is. The question is, do you then use these mediums, whether it's the, the Nollywood stories or the, the Afro beats, as almost like Trojan horse to signal a message why Africa is different than what it used to be, right? Or, or it's always been that way. So I, mean, I think narrative is an important one. And I'm, uh, I know timing is, I want to make sure that we will have the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. So if you have questions, if you could raise your hand, we have mics on the side. Sir, if you could go to the right uh, there and ask your question and introduce yourself and then ask the question. Zacharias, go ahead. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'm asking this question from one of our virtual attendees. Okay. So the question is on net, do you believe that the remittances make up for the brain drain that occurs from the African continent? Interesting, this is a supply side question. Because well, remittances do not come out of thin air, it comes from diasporas who left the countries of origin. Does that, the brain drain issue, and am I, if I'm not mistaken, that's the question. How, how do you, is remittances encouraging brain drain? It's a good, it's an excellent question actually. I don't think that um, it does or does not, I think, it's important. You cannot, you cannot um, overstate or understate the importance of remittance. There are families that depend on it. Yeah. Um, so to me, I think it's 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 a it's a good it's a good um, how do you say this? It is something that's going to be here for a while. I don't know if that answers it. Anybody has any? Um, I'll probably say um, a bit of that, but again, aside that, in some countries in Africa, particularly, um, there's a bit of instability, and um, in most cases. Um, the young people tend to want to, they're quite ambitious and they look at it that if there are no opportunities for them to grow, either their businesses or whatever they want to grow within their countries in Africa, they might look also and say there's an opportunity to go to Europe or America to grow. So aside from remittance, again, it's about the passion, it's about the future ambition that every youth out there, particularly in Nigeria, has yeah. and they intend to want to grow and make a better future for themselves. I guess, I mean, migration is a global phenomenon, yeah. not typically just Africa, but we've seen Latin America and other places, so. Sir. Good afternoon, I'm Darnley Howard. I'm with uh, Pan Diaspora Capital Management, and my question regards the viability of remittances as an investment vehicle. Uh, there have been initiatives in that direction going even way back to, to the Leon Sullivan days even, uh, of, of saying that, well, many Africans are sending money back anyway. Can we mobilize this to help, to help grow businesses? Can we uh, 
organize this? Can we eventually scale it so that it can become uh, a serious growth, a serious capital source uh, for growing African companies? Great question. Any, any one of you? I think you, you touched it earlier because you were involved in uh, remittance-backed uh, mortgages. You know, mortgages and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, the dialogue has been here, but I don't think you'll get, any, you, you'll get a no from us. Uh, you'll get a yes, 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 but I, don't, I think the venture capitalists, the folks who were here before, need to see this as an opportunity and create a business case and really go after it because I could not agree more with you. Uh, it's there. There are programs. I'm part of a colleague, uh, a colleague in, in, in Africa where they're, they're actually trying to, in, in, in um, CMAG countries, mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to create bonds mm -hmm. to actually push this through uh, for farmer workers and how do you create opportunities for microloans, leveraging that. I think, I think that's why we were, yeah. where you were headed. Just to comment on, I think new technologies, and I think Ariel was talking about AI and blockchain, other things, would hopefully try to formalize these flows, right? Absolutely. So you will know now Absolutely. this individual is sending that level of frequency, therefore you could rely on that, therefore you can send uh, you know, other kind. So I think as folks like you, the flood awares, the, and all of you are here, will be the one who's gonna create that next generation of um, technologies that would enable, would give soul to these flows, yeah. right? I'll go to this side, sir. Yeah, you, we can hear you, bro. Hello. Yeah. Okay, my name is Chijoke. I am from Okwebu Capital. My question is this. How are you guys considering peer-to-peer? Because when you look at sending, sending dollars or pounds from the US or the UK to Nigeria, the first thing you face is the fees to send it, the net the person gets is lower, is most like three to five percent. And then, but peer to peer does it faster. The person gets it instantly. The money doesn't even have to leave the country. Mm -hmm. And then the fees, you don't pay the fees. So like, there's a big opportunity there, but no one's talking about it, or people are just overlooking it. Then, then the second part is on regulation. When you're sending money across Africa, there is first the the diaspora regulation, then there is a bigger regulation across the African continent that changes every time. For example, uh, in, in Nigeria, you have that, you have to do a cash out or this or that, and it changes every time. Like, how are you approaching those things from the from opportunity from peer to peer and also regulation? Right. Okay, if I may ask, answer that one. On, on the first question, um, I'll probably say it has to do with what, us working more with the regulators mm -hmm. locally in those countries because, again, as an example to Nigeria, things, things change quite very quickly with regulations and all that. So it's been um, regulators providing an enabling environment for, for that to grow would obviously help. But if um, the regulators locally in those countries are not encouraging that, then it becomes difficult to push this kind of concepts through. Yeah, I think I can add by saying that it's, we need to break this mindset of silos, conversation in silos. Very, very few times you see government officials sitting around a table and touching all those topics together for the benefit of the people. So the regulations, and that's one of the elements that's, that's creating this cost element, because technology is here, but the cost, somebody brought up the fact that the cost is still kind of high. Well, it's because, you know, you talk about privacy, you talk about security for the sender, but you now talk about national security, right? Um, you know, AML, money transfer laundering and whatnot. All those elements need to be taken into account and it adds to the cost of doing business. So the more we digitize the receive market, i.e. financial inclusion, financial literacy, it makes it easier, seamless, to send money from here to anywhere in the world and not have to worry so much about costs. For example, MoneyGram online today, you can send anywhere to Africa for less than $5. Okay, uh, you can go online. Sometimes the more you send, you actually save money. You could send, I sent money two days ago, I paid two ninety nine. I sent $500. This is not far-fetched. You go online, you'll find it. But the funds are, send, are being sent through from a digital platform to a digital. Because now I don't depend on the middle person, yeah. right? A middle agent who also, whether CVS or any of the partner, who also collects a, a, a commission, right? Yep. So now I'm, de I'm dealing directly from me, my bank account into my relative's bank account. So digitalization is a key conversation between government officials so they understand 
what that does, what remittance does. I think once we start having those conversations, we will find solutions and those questions will become mute in the future. Uh, I think related to the question I'll pose it, we tend to define diaspora as a, an entity that is in the Western world. Mm. But I think you alluded to it, there are intra, like there are Nigerians who live in Ghana or, or in South Africa and what have you. How do you, as your products then built differently because they're the, either, the, the, either the foreign exchange that they deal with is different than, or the intra agreements between intra Africa is different than dealing with the UK. I'm wondering how are you viewing diasporas in, in those lenses? I think this is what, where pan-Africanism, if that's a word, yeah. is really important. Um, because as a company, if you have a presence in the different African countries, you can kind of bypass the traditional, I want to move money between Nigeria and Ghana, but my friends are first going to Frankfurt or yeah. going to New York or going to London. And so that's also a, a reason why expansion within Africa is very important because it, it helps you do away with some of the longer and um, therefore more expensive processes. Mm. Anybody else? I, I, I also think that it has to do with a lot of history, a lot of the, the, the lines that were drawn yeah. uh, by the, I don't want to go back in colony, you know, the, the, those colonies and those lines and whatnot. Sometimes, again, Another thing my mother used to say, when you want to keep an elephant docile, you put a rope around the leg, right, when they're young. Mm -hmm. As you remove, as they're getting older, you remove that rope, they will still think there's a rope, right? So the boundary is we've all become independent, but I think our government agencies or governments still think that we are not, right? We still have those lines. It's about creating those trade talks talks about it. Do we need to have, because intra-Africa is probably one of the most underreported yep. flow of cash. Mm -hmm. Because think about it, the rate of underbanked African is huge. The rate of demand of services for commodities and whatnot is huge. So you would know that there's money being moved between people without touching the banks. Mm -hmm. Somebody's making money off of it. Those are phone operators, Vodacom, Airtel, and so on and so forth. So they're able to figure out how to do it. We just now need to get our regulations, our government, to also understand that, hey, let's make it easier for people to move money between Ghana to Kinshasa, between Accra to Kinshasa, to Nairobi, and so on and so forth, which is an opportunity that we need to exploit. Great. Can, can I, sorry, can I touch on point. the regulation point? I think that's a very important question, that your point that you raised. I think it is super important that regulators actually do their job, which is keeping up with the technology. And unfortunately, I feel in the African continent, they have been so slow moving with FinTech, where a lot of these uh, uh, innovators just don't have regulatory status because it doesn't exist. You know, um, It's not to say that other places like the UK have been extremely fast, but they have just been a little bit more quick to embrace you know, possibly controversial technologies like cryptocurrencies or peer-to-peer -peer transactions, crowdfunding. And I think the regulators are doing fintechs a really great disservice by not moving more quickly to give them some sort of regulatory status. I mean, at the end of the day, it can really impact their bottom line or strangle them from growing to unicorn status. Awesome. Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Samuel Badu, um, and I'm here from Flarry. So while we're speaking about diaspora banking and remittances, um, we often tend to talk about remittance sends going to the continent. And Mr. Foley, I was wondering, what is the narrative that we're telling around building a more resilient um, diaspora? Because one of the things that's underspoken about or underreported uh, is the fact that the biggest obstacle to the success of the aspirants financially comes from the level of financial involvement that they have with their families back home. Mm -hmm. So how do we build um, maybe rails or guardrails around the way we move money back home that allows more transparency and um, allows for the diaspora to be able to pick and choose what they are financially getting involved in to give themselves an opportunity to build up their own financial lives here. Um, I'd like to really hear what thoughts you have on how 
either your organizations or other ways that we could help with that? Excellent question. And I think blockchain, 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 blockchain. Right? That would that could facilitate that as well, and it is already doing that. There's, there's uh, from a MoneyGram standpoint, again, staying in our lane. Uh, we're not here to solve every social problem or whatnot, but we are here to provide a vehicle for you, sir, to move money from point A to point B. But having said that, as a as a global player as well, we attract different uh, you know attention from different companies. Now we are really spending a lot more time with blockchain, you know, venturing into the blockchain because it tackles what you are just saying. You know, how do you empower the sender? And not, you know, to empower the sender to maybe find it that it's not only cost effective, but what are other avenues that I can invest some of the money that I'm making to invest here so that I have more? Or how do I improve my life here in, in America uh, or in the UK or whatnot while also caring for my family? So I think it's about options. The market has become extreme, extremely non exclusive. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, you probably would have had. MoneyGram here and the other guys. I don't, I'm not going to give them the time. Um, you would have the two of us sitting here, right? But now look how beautiful it is where you have more people, more companies jumping into the ecosystem. So I think technology and oh, clearly blockchain technology will help facilitate or make it easier. I don't know if anybody has any. Go ahead, officer. I don't think there's any major city in the United States where you won't find an Asian bank or at least a Chinese bank. And I think that's the level Africa needs to be on. Um, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. We know ourselves best. Um, we need to cater to our financial needs <laughs> by ourselves. I, I, I don't think of, I, I don't think I know, outside of Houston, I don't think I know of a bank that caters to African diaspora. And that is extremely crucial. When people first move here, whether it's for school, whether it's for work, they struggle to access the financial ecosystem sometimes. And it's for the same reason we've discussed. <laughs> they don't under not, not every financial institution understands. And so it's really important for us to have more NABUs, more flutter waves, more banks that cater to the diaspora. You can build products that are specific to the diaspora. You can service the financial needs of the diaspora in one go. Interesting. So there is um, also the FinTech in Africa is having a renaissance time, right? Mm -hmm. You're, and I know uh, at least Leatherback, um, you guys were able to raise about $10 million? $10 million, dollars, yeah. Precede, which is Pre unheard yeah. of, frankly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that to raise that kind of money. So what do you see the prospect from a VC perspective with all the, even the problems we just even raised in this conversation, that yeah. there are a lot of markets out here, even the one you just discussed about. Where, where do you see, uh, is, because at the end of the day, you, you know, you could talk about the love of doing this, but as Tina Turner would always say, what has love got to do with it, right? Where are the resources needed to stand these type of ventures out there? I know you've just had through this experience of raising this money. Yeah. How difficult was it? Was the narrative that you, you kind of put out resonated with the market? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious to, to learn. Okay, so in terms of from, for Leatherback, the unique um, um, thing which I would say we have is the fact that we've got the appetite for frontier markets, which in most cases are current competitors particularly in the UK, as, as shining away for. So that is an aspect which um, we focused on and which we mastered on and which we believe would take us to the next level in terms of being able to serve um, the, the markets or the corridors whereby the current players um, that in the UK and elsewhere are not looking um, to go into. So um, um, for us, that's, that's the next line which we're looking to. And we're all, um, during, during the time we're, we're raising the pre-seeds, we had a lot of interest in terms of funding, but we thought, let's have this first um, round and see how that goes and in the nearest um, future we can actually raise more but for us the key thing is that we're going into a space mm -hmm. that everyone or most people are shying away to go into okay great anybody else sir? um you know t to be frank I again i think it's a money supply challenge where um my experience has been most of the vcs are interested mm -hmm but they perhaps have LPs that are not local. Mm. And so there's an issue there where, again, we, we're not owning the, our own money supply. So I, I feel that there needs to be more, um, a less conservative and more aggressive 
appetite in the continent local with fintech. That, that's the only way to that's solve it. To solve. Yeah. Great. Um, so I know we're running out of time. So I don't see any other questions, but I'll let you guys then wrap it up. I know folks are hungry. I'm hungry. I, don't know <laughs> I am too. But so if I can start from you, Gabrielle, just what are your kind of, you know, final remarks in terms of what do you want people to leave, not just about the concept of what we're discussing, but actually even your own venture. What do you want them to do in terms of making sure that you're, we're increasing the success for you and, and, your, and the type of organizations that you're trying to build? Well, I'll say selfishly, we are looking to talk to any fintech or bank that needs clearing or correspondent uh, banking services at the conference. But I, I do want to end on a positive note that, again, I think it is super fantastic, super special that we're all here. Um, I think it's phenomenal. We have people on the panel who are very humble, but really, you know, mm -hmm. they're superstars in their own right. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to celebrate it. I think we're at a point in our culture and community where we're at this inflection point. And there's nothing stopping us if we work together and we collaborate. I love it. Thank okay, you. So um, for us, in terms of um, the product which we're bringing out, which is providing banking solutions for businesses and individuals, mm -hmm. um, um, we believe that in terms of looking at that in the long run, that would help um, companies, as an example, that are probably not based in some jurisdiction, actually have businesses mm -hmm. or revenues that can help them accelerate their growth. So um, we're looking to, um, to partner to speak to businesses that are willing to have that opportunity that we can provide them the services whereby they not necessarily being in a country doesn't mean that they don't have an operation or how they can receive funds or collect funds in those countries. And first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers. This is a fantastic panel. I could not agree more with what Gabriel said. Uh, from a MoneyGram standpoint, what I would like to all of you to leave this, this forum with is that yes, we have legacy, but we are a legacy that's also fintech-ish. <laughs> so if you can find a hybrid between the two, we have a solution for just about everything you can think about right now. Give us a try, go onto our website, download our app, moneygram.com, download the app, and you will see the benefits. And again, I thank you all for giving us a platform to, to, to come to your homes or be here in front of you. And I'm looking forward to chatting with all of you afterwards. Um, one of our philosophies at Flutterwave is we see partnerships and not competition. Mm. Um, it's impossible for a single entity to cover the entire continent, to cover the entire world. And if our ultimate goal is to make it easy to transact and make it cheaper to transact, there can't be competition. There just has to be partnerships. There just has to be working together to meet both of those objectives. So um, invite <laughs> anyone who's interested in sending to Africa. Um, have a chat with us. Awesome. My final remarks obviously are thank you for obviously for this edifying conversation. The plug from my side, from the state side, is obviously we are a strategic partner of the continent. We, we, we have a very strong relationship with a lot of these countries that we've, we've discussed. And uh, lean on us in a sense of anything that the US government could do in terms of supporting the proliferation of these type of activities is great. Love seeing LPs in the VC world and the startup world in the US when we saw Stripe buying uh, some of the unicorns out of, that was kind of a, a heyday for us and ensure that that tissue between the US and Africa is still maintained. And to me, is FinTech is not just the financial services element of it, but FinTech enables, powers everything, yeah. right? Including one of the highest priority we have is climate. The climate change challenge that the continent faces, the global, but for climate tech to happen, FinTech has to happen Absolutely. because for every transaction that needs to happen, there has to be a financial element of making that happen. So FinTech is not for the sake of just Fin, yeah. but it is actually empowers a lot of that industries, whether it's agriculture, the ag tech, you know, food security is a huge issue now. Huge. As you can imagine, that's about to unfold due to the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what not have you. But FinTech is going to play a critical role in powering the continent, empowering the world. And you know, all power to you, anything that we could do, uh, you have us at hello in that sense. And I appreciate, for those of you who are watching us, I hope you've, um, you've enjoyed this conversation. Please engage with them directly. You can find their contact information on the, on the program. Uh, until next time, it's been amazing, and I want to thank, obviously, AFTS for organizing this. They've been awesome. Thank you. Uh, uh, hopefully, the, co the conversation continue to be as robust as, as it's been. So, thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, it is now time for a lunch break, so if you want to make your way out, if you follow the sign and um, the ushers to the, to the lunch buffet and, and enjoy networking, talking to each other, we, can recon we will have the AFTS awards during lunch and then we'll uh, meet again at 2.05, if you can please be on time. Uh, we'll have three different sessions, one on banking, another one on fintech regulation, and uh, simultaneously a workshop for, for founders, PR for founders. Enjoy your lunch, see you, see you in a bit. <laughs>